delighted that you're here, and I hope you've got your Bible with you. We're continuing a study that we began a couple of weeks ago on sin and grace, a series of seven lessons, and we're ready for our third tonight. We have considered the nature of sin in our first study, and last time we talked about the nature of grace, some misunderstandings that some have concerning sin. We'll allude to that again this evening and some misunderstandings that some have concerning grace. Tonight we want to raise the question about man's ability to obey, man's ability to obey God. And so our question is, does man have the ability to obey God's Word? And you say, well, sure he does. I want to suggest to you that there are some who say that, no, we can't at all, period. Others will say, well, we can a lot, but we can't do everything that God would ask us to do. And so let me ask you, why would we even need to raise such a question? Why do we need to raise the question, can we obey the Word of God? Well, if I could convince you tonight that you're not totally capable of living right, would that make a difference in your life? Now, let's just suppose, for argument's sake, that the point of the lesson tonight, which it is not, but if it were to be, that I'm trying to convince you, you are not capable of obeying God. And the compelling, the evidence was so compelling, you walk away being convinced of that, would that make any difference in your life? What if I convinced you that you cannot help but sin? You are incapable of resisting sin. And what if I could convince you that you cannot obey God's revelation without some kind of divine intervention? That the only way you can do what God told you to do is that God comes and He helps you obey. You can't obey on your own. In other words, you can't read the Word of God and just do what it says. And what if I could convince you that you cannot do what God has commanded without God acting upon you for you then to be obedient to that? Would that make any difference? You say, well, let me think about that. While you're thinking, let me say it absolutely would make a difference. It absolutely would make a difference. Because what that would mean is that puts all the responsibility upon God. <clears throat> I'm not responsible because, you see, I couldn't resist sin in the first place. And so if you sin, you can't really help it. So if I come and talk to you about sin or you come and talk to me about sin, I might tell you, you know what, I couldn't help that. I'm not capable of resisting. Remember, I can't obey God anyway. I'm incapable of doing that. And it means that you can't really know, do all that God says because you can't measure up. And so when someone points to a text and says, you know, God said do thus and so, and you're not doing that, he said, I'm incapable of doing that. It certainly would make a big difference. And I want to suggest to you that that concept is taught today, that man doesn't have the ability to obey God. Much of that is in denominationalism in our Calvinistic friends who think that man is incapable of obeying God. But that's not the only place where that's taught. I want to tell you that some of our own brethren are telling us that you are incapable of fully obeying God. That's just not possible. You can't resist sin. In fact, you're in sin right now. We talked about in that in our first study. But you also are incapable of obeying God. And so we'll talk about how that comes about in just a moment. So let's talk about man's ability to obey. That's our focal point in our study tonight. Does man have the ability to obey? Let's start with this. Let's talk about the erroneous concept of man being unable to obey God. That is an erroneous concept. Let's start with what we call classic Calvinism. Now, why do we qualify Calvinism? You say, I thought Calvinism was Calvinism. Well, Calvinism is not always Calvinism in this sense. There is what we might label as classic or full-fledged Calvinism. This is the person that buys into the whole system of Calvinism. They believe that man is totally depraved, man is unconditionally elected, there is limited atonement, irresistible grace will come back to, and there is the perseverance of the saints. They buy the whole system, lock, stock, and barrel. Now the classic Calvinist says that when Adam sinned, man lost his free will. We touched on that in our first study. That is, man lost his ability to choose. So Adam had free will. He could choose, and he chose wrongly, and he chose to sin. And by that action, all mankind following that lost the ability to choose. 
So after Adam, all men are totally depraved, meaning they're unable to do any good. You see where we're going now? You see, that concept of total depravity means man is totally, get that point, totally depraved. He is incapable or incapable of doing any good. So he couldn't obey if he tried. So if God gave him a command, he could not respond. If God issues something to him, he couldn't even hear God. He cannot do anything good at all. He's totally depraved. And so thus man has a corrupt nature. That means man is unable to resist sin. That means he's not capable of doing good. He is incapable of obeying. He cannot obey any command. You pick any command and he cannot do that. The classic Calvinist would so argue. So the only way man can respond is the, with the direct operation of the Holy Spirit called irresistible grace. You see, then you say, well, I don't understand. There are Calvinists who say they believe in God, and they do. And they say they believe in Christ. How did they ever become believers in the first place? They believe that separate and apart from the Word of God, God operated directly by the Holy Spirit up on them, and that's irresistible. They had no selection in the process. God made them a believer separate and apart from the Word by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. Now, therefore, since all of that's true in their mind, we have to have a plan of salvation that is without obedience, thus unconditional election. So when you talk to the full-fledged Calvinist, the Calvinist is saying, oh, you don't have to obey God. There are no conditions of salvation. Why does he have to have that? Because, you see, he believes this whole system, and he believes man is totally depraved, incapable of doing any good. Now, I'm not concerned about the classic Calvinist. I'm tonight concerned about the neo-Calvinist, or as one brother puts it, and I like the way he words it, the soft Calvinist. That's the person who buys a portion of the system, but they do not buy the whole system. So what I'm suggesting you do is that to charge some of our brethren with teaching Calvinistic ideas is not to suggest they accept classic Calvinism. Now put this down in a footnote in your mind. If you talk to some of these brethren that we'll talk about later and say, well, I believe that you believe in Calvinism, they'll be real quick to say, I deny Calvinism. What that means is they reject classic Calvinism, the full-fledged system. That doesn't mean they don't have implications of Calvinistic thinking, and that's where we want to focus in our study tonight. The continuous cleansing concept holds to this Calvinistic concept. Well, how does the continuous cleansing work? The continuous cleansing said the Christian is sinning all the time and can't help sinning. We talked about that in our first study. That even right now, you are committing sin. You're living in sin right now. So, since that's true, cleansing needs to be automatic and continuous. In other words, if you're going to be saved at all from the sin you're committing right now, God has to automatically be washing that away and removing that just on a continual, automatic basis. That's how that works. Thus, the continuous cleansing concept. I want to suggest that some believe the righteousness of Christ is transferred. Take note of that term. It is transferred to us, thus the imputation. Does the Bible talk about imputation? Yes, but it never talks about transference of sin or transference of righteousness. Never does the Bible talk about that. So this concept of imputed righteousness, the transferring of Christ's righteousness to us, is based in this neo-Calvinistic concept. It's rooted in the same concepts of ca classic Calvinism. This concept is based upon the idea that man is unable to resist sin. It's based on the concept that he's unable to obey God's commands. That's why I need the imputation, in their sense, of the transferring of God, the righteousness of Christ to me, is because I'm incapable of obeying God. I'm living in a state of sin right now. So I need the righteousness of Christ transferred over to me so that when God looks at me, He sees righteousness. Because I can't be righteous. I can't do that. I cannot obey God. That's the neo-Calvinistic concept. There is one brother among us who made this statement. This is his modified statement from the original statement after he was called into question. He said, Calvin, this was a lesson on Calvinism, by the way, refuting Calvinism, but he points out throughout the lesson there are sections of Calvinism where Calvin got it right. 
And I would agree that Calvin was right about some things. Not in his system of Calvinism, but listen to the quote. Calvinism also agrees with the Bible in this. God in some ways commands things of us we cannot do in order to drive us to Him and His grace in order to accomplish them. Wait a minute. Hear what he just said? He said, God commands some things of us that we cannot do. God tells you to do something, but you can't do what he told you to do. Why did he do that? To drive you to his grace, he said. He said, this demonstrates the empowering nature of God's saving grace. I have said in the past, and I hear it said often, that if God commands something of us, that obviously means we can do it. However, the Bible demonstrates a different point regarding Regarding at least some of God's commands, and Calvin sees this with partial accuracy. Catch his point? His point is God commands something. Now, some things you can obey, but there's some things God tells you to do you can't do. Well, I want to know what those some things are. It might be one of the things I'm struggling with, so I don't need to worry about doing that because I can't do it anyway. See, it might be that attendance for for somebody. I just can't do it. Or it might be avoiding lust. That might be something you can't do. What is the thing you can't do? That's interesting. This is from a brother among non-institutional churches of Christ. Now let's talk about the abuse text. Passages that are used that are offered as proof of this concept. That man has the inability to obey. Now I'm going to go back to classic Calvinism for a moment. Because I'm not sure that our brethren, some of our brethren would use these passages. And I'll, I'll make the distinction as we go along. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. So let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 3, if you will. And let's talk about Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 9. So those who have this concept, you say, well, I've never read in my Bible anywhere where you cannot obey God. The classic Calvinist and some of the neo-Calvinists will appeal to Romans 3. So let's see what Romans 3 says. The argument is based upon verses 10 through 12, where none are righteous. So let's go there and see what verses 10 through 12 say. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There are none who seek after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. You say, you can't do good. You say, wait a minute. Sure sounds that way, doesn't it? Here's a passage that says, none do good. They're all unrighteous. And yet I thought we were supposed to be righteous people. This passage does not argue for inability, but the fact that man sins. I know that because of the context. Chapter 1 shows the Gentiles are in sin. Chapter 2 shows the Jews are in sin. Chapter 3 wraps that all together and funnels those two concepts together. In verse 9, we have before concluded that all are under sin. Verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you'll take note, verses 10 through 12 are within that section of verses of 9 to 23. So that it is... It is parentheses or book, bookended by all have sinned, all have sinned. The point is not about inability, but the fact that man sins. Now I want you to notice verse 12. Verse 12 says that man has altogether become unprofitable. Now, notice first of all verse 12 said they're gone out of the way. They have turned aside. They have become unprofitable. That is a quotation from Psalm 14. Now, if man is incapable of doing good, he's also incapable of making a choice. A choice was made in Psalm 14. A choice was made in verses 10 through 12. He was righteous. He chose to become unrighteous. So if he became unrighteous, he made a choice. Man does indeed have a choice. So the conclusion of our text is that all have sinned and all need salvation. Verse 9, verse 23. It is not the conclusion that when we get through with the chapter, we have now concluded and seen from chapter 3 that no one has the ability to obey God. That would seem strange in a book that starts on the note of obedience, chapter 1 and verse 5, and chapter 16 and verse 26, obedience again. Strange a book, again bookended by obedience and obedience, that in the middle of the book it says you can't do it anyway. That seems a little bit strange. 
Our conclusion from the text is we're not justified by deeds of the law, verse 20, but we're justified by obedience to the faith. Now let's get that point that I alluded to from chapter 1. The book starts on the note, I don't mean the very first verse, but in the first chapter that he says, Romans 1 and verse 5, through whom we have received the grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith. He seemed to think at the beginning of the book, one could be obedient to the faith. Now let's go over to the end of the book, chapter 16 now, and notice at verse 26, there seems to be the same writer, same concept, but now has made manifest and by prof, uh, prophetic scriptures has made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for the obedience to the faith. He starts on the note, ends on the note, one can be obedient to the faith. So this passage must not be talking about man's inability to obey. I agree fully with Brother Rees. He said concerning uh, Romans chapter 3 that he is not saying that for the Christian, even on his very best day, he is unable to be right with God. He is saying that if we're outside of Christ, even on our very best day, we're not right with God. That's what Romans 3 is about. That's what Romans 1 was about. That's what Romans 2 was about. All three chapters, if you're out of Christ, you're not a child of God and you're living in sin, on your very best day, you cannot be right with God. It is not saying you as a child of God do the best you can, you still can't obey God. Nothing in the context that even begins to touch top edge side nor bottom of that concept. Now, let's go to Romans 7 and 8. By that, I'm talking about chapter 7 and chapter 8, not chapter 7 and then verse 8. Romans 7 and 8. The argument made from Romans 7 is based on verse 18. The argument is that this is describing the Christian and that there is none that do good or there's nothing good in him. So let's go to Romans 7 and verse 18. It says, for I know that in me, this is Paul writing, and he was a Christian, wasn't he? That's how the argument goes. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Well, that sounds pretty strange. Paul is supposed to be a Christian, and he said, I know that in me nothing good dwells. So that means no obedience dwells. You can't do anything good. It's impossible to do good. Now, the context this is quite interesting and strange that the previous chapter had just told us that we're not to continue in sin. Then in the next chapter, he says, I can't help it, though. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. I'm not to continue in sin. But there's nothing good that dwells in me. I'm living the Christian life, doing the best I can, and I still can't do anything right. I still can't obey God. Seems to be out of harmony, doesn't it? Well, let's start with this concept, that Romans 7 is not descriptive of the Christian. That is our first fundamental flaw of this argument. Romans 7 is not describing the Christian, saying this is the Christian, this is the struggle the Christian goes through. If you're familiar with Romans 7, there's obviously a struggle going on in the context of one knowing what he ought to do, and yet he doesn't do that. We'll get to that struggle here in just a second. Here's evidence that it's not talking about the Christian. Whoever he's talking about and describing, and actually what Paul is doing is describing his life before he became a Christian. That's why he refers to it in first person. That I, me, he's talking about himself before he became a child of God. Let's look at evidence of that now beginning at verse 8. He said, but sin taking opportunity by commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. And apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. That is, I became accountable to God and I committed sin and I separated myself from God. Whoever is under discussion in Romans chapter 7, it's a person who's not dead to sin, like Romans 6, but he's dead in sin. All right, here's something else. Notice verse 14. You might underline this one for future study. That is, he said, I'm carnal, sold under sin. Remember chapter 6 says well, that we're not to continue in sin. Don't continue to practice sin. But over here, he's sold under sin. Sounds contradictory if this is both are talking about the child of God. Look at verse 14. Whoever he's talking about, they were under the law. Speaking of Old Testament law. By the way, Romans uh, 7, 4 and Romans 7, 9 have to be talking about Old Testament law because he deals with that specifically in quotes from the Ten Commandments at verse 7. So the person under discussion has been under the Old Testament law and furthermore, sin dwells in him, verse 20. Look at verse 20 now. He said, for no longer I, 
uh, will I, um, no, uh, now if I do what I will not do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Romans 6, it said, don't let sin dwell in you. But over here, sin is dwelling in him. This person needs deliverance. Look at verse 24. He said, oh, wretched my, oh, man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Well, if it's the child of God, there is no deliverance because you're going to be in this state. And you're living in it right now if you're a child of God, if that be the case. But this is a person who needs deliverance and his life is miserable, not one of peace, not one of relationship with God. I think God, he said in verse 20, oh, I actually mean instead of verse 25, verse 24, oh, wretched man that I am. He's in a wretched, terrible condition. This is a miserable life that he's living. And so we have a number of reasons why this is not talking about the child of God. There is nothing in Romans 7, again, talking about inability to obey. Not one thing about ability to obey or inability to obey. The point is that one cannot be and was not saved apart from the gospel of Christ. Romans 7 is talking about one who before he became a child of God, he is in a lost condition. We'll see his salvation in chapter 8. Notice in chapter 8 in verse 2. Remember he had raised the question, who shall deliver me from this body of death? At verse 2 he said, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. He's made free by the law of Christ. He wasn't made free by the law he was under. He's made free by the law of Christ. What this text describes, beginning at verse 15, is man's weakness, not his inability. How so? Look at verse 15. He doesn't do what he knows to be right. That's not his inability, that's his weakness. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 25, 26 and verse 41. Let's start at verse 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, I do not practice. And what I hate, I do. What's he mean by that? I know what I ought to be doing, but that's not what I do. Things that I don't want to do and I know I shouldn't do, I end up doing. Has nothing to do with man's inability to obey. It's his weakness in obeying. Let's go read further. Look at verse 16. If then I do what I will not do, I agree with the law that is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. What's he saying? I know what I ought to be doing, but I don't always do that. I know what God's commanded, but I don't always obey the command. I know what God has forbidden, but I don't always stay with that. I sometimes do what's forbidden. That's a focus on man's weakness, not his inability. Now go back to verse 8. The weakness in his flesh chooses to sin. Let's go back to verse 8. It, didn't, it wasn't that he could not choose to sin or obey. But his weakness led to that. Go back to verse 10. But sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. He had a choice in the matter. And he chose to commit sin. When the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Verse 9. And so what I'm learning from this context is Romans 7 says nothing about inability. It has everything to do with man's weakness. Now let's go to Romans 8 and verse 8. Same context. We go one chapter over. Romans 8 and verse 8 is used that those in the flesh cannot please God. And you are in the flesh, you're a Christian, you're a child of God, you're in the flesh, the argument goes, so that those in the flesh cannot please God. You can't obey God, in other words. And because you have that inability to do that. You cannot obey God because of Romans 8 and verse 8. Now again, Romans 8 does not describe man's nature, but his choice. It is not saying that you by nature are a sinner. Nothing in the context argues that. Nothing in the book argues that. It is not talking about man's nature, that he is unable to please God, but his choice is. It is not describing man's inability, but again, his choice. That's what Romans 8 is talking about. Now get this point. What Romans 8 is saying is that man, while continuing in sin, cannot be pleasing to God. Now let's go back and look at verse 8 and verse, verse 7 and 8 together. Let's get verse 6 along with that. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You mean I have a choice? I could choose to be spiritually minded or I could choose to be carnally minded. Absolutely. Look at verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. If I choose the carnal manner, I'm an enemy of God. For it is 
not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Does that mean I can't obey? No, I've just not submitted myself to the law of God. Now verse 8, so that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That is, I can't please God while doing things that displease God. So when I'm telling lies, and I know it's wrong to tell lies, but I'm telling them anyway, I cannot please God. And when I'm over here uh, cursing, knowing God says that's wrong, then I still can't please God. As long as I'm continuing in sin... I cannot please God. That's the point of Romans 8. But let's go to another argument. Now, some of our neo-Calvinists may, may argue along the line of Romans 3, Romans 7, the full Calvinist would. But some of our own brethren now are arguing from this. Remember the quote from a brother a little bit earlier? That God commands what man cannot accomplish. Now, that same brother I quoted earlier makes the argument that God tells man to do things that man cannot do on his own. And here is his outline. Now, though this is a little small for you to read, so I'm going to read the sections that you need to, to see. Starting with the highlighted section, that being said, uh, he said, Calvin is right that God does at times command of us what we cannot accomplish. Same guy we talked about a moment ago. That God sometimes commands us to do things that we can't do, and so that's to drive us to Him, because we can't do that. Well, what, what do you mean? What, well, let's give some biblical illustrations. There are seven in number. And I'm not going to read every word of this, but he talks about the case where Moses was told to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. He couldn't have done that without the hand of God. God told him to do that. Here's another command. God commanded uh, Israel to take, possess the promised land. They couldn't take the promised land, storm the the nation and take it without God relying on God. All right, so far, so good. Gideon was told to deliver the Israel from Midian. Joshua and Zerubbabel were told to rebuild the temple. Peter was told to walk on the water. Number five, number six, Peter commanded the lame man to walk. And number seven, we're commanded to walk in a worthy manner of our calling. And so these are examples, particularly the first six of those, are supposed to be examples where God commanded to do something and they couldn't do that unless God somehow intervened with that. So likewise, with our commands, when God has commanded you to do something, like number seven, you cannot do that unless God intervenes somehow. You say, wow, that sounds pretty good. I want you to understand this point. These points only demonstrate man's ability to save himself, not his inability to be obedient. Now God told me, Moses, for example, to go deliver the children of Israel. He couldn't do that by himself. I understand that. But he can obey God, such as going to Pharaoh without God intervening, making him go to Pharaoh. There's a difference in that. Now, God wants you to be saved, and you can't save yourself, but that doesn't mean you cannot believe without God causing you to believe, and you couldn't be baptized without God causing you to be baptized. All of these examples only demonstrate man's ability to save himself. They do not demonstrate at all man's inability to be obedient unto God. There's nothing in any of those examples to suggest that man cannot obey God without some empowering aid. That's a phrase some of our brethren use. God empowers you. You need to be empowered. There's nothing in these passages to suggest man cannot obey God without God giving you some empowering aid apart from the Word. So God commands you to forgive, and you say, I, don't, I just don't think I'm capable of doing it. So God empowers you to do that, and you can now do it because God did something separate and apart from the Word. What's the difference in that and the direct operation of the Holy Spirit on the alien center? And while you ponder that, let me suggest there is none. Here's the fourth of those arguments. And that is, if we're slaves to sin, then we have a need for God's empowering aid. Here's how the argument goes. That if one sins, he becomes a slave to sin, and that's what John 8, 34 says. And so, so far, so good. I agree with that. You do too. And so if he becomes a slave to sin, he needs to be empowered to break free from the bonds of sin. So you're bound in the bonds of sin, and there's no way to break out of that without God empowering you to do that. Well, we're kind of mixing uh, apples and oranges. That's based on an assumption. We're still assuming he can't obey. That assumption is still being made. That hasn't been proven by this text or any other. So we should have a basic assumption that's still being assumed. And that is man has the inability to obey. What we're starting with is a passage that says you're a bond and you're a slave to sin, and you need to be broke free from that 
and we assume you can't obey. That's what their argument is. It makes a great assumption. Let's go to Romans 6. And let's see if we can tie some of this together. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 talks about slavery. Romans 6 talks about grace. Romans 6 talks about obedience. And they all work together. Let's see what Romans 6 says. Romans 6, beginning at verse 16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, the one who slaves you, uh, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? What did I learn? The same thing I learned from John 8, 34. You submit yourself to sin, you become a slave of sin. I need to be broke free from that. How on earth is this going to be done? Is this going to be done by grace? Does it involve grace? Absolutely. Chapter 6, verse 14 says so. Are you denying grace? No, I'm not denying grace. The only way we can be broke free from the sin is the grace of God allows us to be broke free. But I'm still looking for the answer to the question, can man be obedient without some empowering aid of God? And so far, this argument hadn't touched that. So let's go to verse 17. But God be think that though you were the slaves of sin, you did what? You did what? Are you reading with me? Though you were the slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. You see, they were slaves of sin, and yet by the grace of God, they came free from that, but they were obedient. Nothing at all in this text indicates they had to be empowered to obey. Man saying, I want to believe and I want to be baptized, but I can't do it. I'm trying, but I can't do it. So God somehow empowers him to do that separate and apart from the word and the encouragement that's found in the word of God. Now, finally, let's talk about the assurance from God that man has the ability to obey. I see the misconception. I see the abuse text. Let's get some assurance from God. We can obey. Let's start with the Old Testament. You may find this helpful. You say, well, one passage would do, but this is as we've been talking in our sermon class, that sometimes you want to compound some evidence, and this is one of those occasions where we want to compound some evidence. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. Um, and we've talked about this already, but I want to make another point from Genesis chapter 4, beginning at verse 6 and 7. We just want to see, could man be obedient to God? Or, is, or does the text indicate man is unable and incapable of obeying God? That's all we're looking for in these texts. So let's start with Cain, that uh, verse 6, Genesis chapter 4, and in verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, I'm reading at verse 7, would you not be accepted? But if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and its desire shall be for you, and you shall rule over it. So what am I learning from that? Cain was able to do well. He was able to be obedient. And that's all we're wanting to see. Could he be obedient? The text says indeed that he could. Now we're still talking about an Old Testament character, but we're going to go to a New Testament reference. And this time to Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 8 and talk about Abraham. Abraham obeyed when he was called to go into land. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go into a place that he would later receive for an inheritance. No indication that God somehow empowered him. He couldn't have done it anyway. So God made him do it. No indication of that at all. He obeyed the call to go to a land. Now, I'm quite interested in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Uh, and that's because Israel was told they, they could obey. And I want us to look at Deuteronomy 30, beginning at verse 11 through verse 14. There's two sections here I want us to look at. First of all, the argument is made that what God has told you to do is not that hard. And let's see the wording and see if it doesn't sound familiar to you. Now notice he said, For this is the commandment which I command you today. It is not too mysterious, mysterious for you, nor is it far off. Now let's stop and talk about a far off. The Jews used an expression, if something was far off, it means it's out of their reach. They couldn't touch it. They couldn't attain it. Now if man cannot obey God, the commands of God are out of our reach. They're far off. I'm reaching and I can't obtain it. I'm stretching and I can't touch it. He said it is, notice again, he said, it is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who shall ascend into heaven to bring it to us that we may hear it and obey it? In other words, the, God, the commands of God are not way up there where I can't reach them. Somebody go get it and bring it down, then I can obey it. That's not how it is. 
Nor is it beyond the sea, verse 13, that you should say, who shall go over the sea to bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is near you in your mouth and your heart that you may do it. In other words, it's as close as your mind and as close as your mouth. It's reachable, it's touchable. You can do it. It's near you, it's not hard. That's quoted, by the way, in Romans 10 and applied to our salvation. The illustration Paul uses in Romans 10, it's as easy as believing with your mind and confessing with your mouth. You can do it. It's within your reach. That's his argument, and he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 30. So thus I'm concluding the commands of God in both Old and New Testament are within man's ability to do. But let's go further. Notice beginning at now verse 15, same context, Deuteronomy 30. Beginning at verse 15, man has a choice. We won't read all of this, but he said, I set before you today life and good, death and evil. In the command that I give you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all His ways and to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments. But now drop down to verse 17. If your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I will announce to you that you shall perish. And then he goes on at verse 20 saying that you may love the Lord your God and that you may obey His voice. In other words, what I'm learning is that man has a choice. You can obey or you can disobey. You obey, you'll be blessed. You disobey, you'll be cursed. What am I learning? Man has the ability to obey. Without turning there, Joshua 25, choose you to this day whom you shall serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua and Israel could serve to uh, choose to obey. First Chronicles, I'm just going to mention this in passing because I want to get to uh, another point. In First Chronicles 28, Solomon was given a choice. He could be obedient like David, or he could choose to be one who was disobedient. He had a choice. Jeroboam had the same kind of choice. and just showing you compounding evidence throughout the Old Testament the kings were told you could obey. You may not, but you could. You have that choice. Now let's come to the New Testament. And I'm going to put several passages. We won't notice all of these, but I want to give you a sampling that time and again God said we can obey. Let's start at the end. 1 Peter 1, 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. So you can obey. Let's go to, uh, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Christ, though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Man can obey. The kingdom is for those who uh, obey and do the will of the Lord, Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 21. One more I mentioned, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7 through 9, simply says that if you don't obey, Christ is coming in flaming fire taking vengeance. So again, we have compounding evidence all through the New Testament. Man can obey, man can obey, man can obey. But may I suggest this to you? That if man does not have the ability to obey God, that means God's Word is meaningless. If man does not have the ability to obey, God's Word has no power at all. If man has the inability to obey, God's Word produces no effect. And I've often wondered why the full-fledged classic Calvinists preach sermons. There are preachers all across the country that believe in full-fledged Calvinism. And they get before an audience and they preach the message of God. Why? If the people already believe, it's because God caused them to believe. And if they don't believe, you can't help them at all. <laughs> I don't understand. Why to preach for them? Why? Why just give up? Why not just quit? If man has the inability to obey, God's word becomes ineffective and meaningless. Now, this is a powerful question. This is not original with me, but a powerful question. Is there any example of God commanding us to do anything that we do not have the ability to do? And if so, what would it be? That's like the question earlier in the lesson one. There's some sins that don't separate. Okay, name one. What is that sin? I want to know what it is. And nobody's ever named one sin. So, well, here's the sin. All right. When someone says, well, there's just some commands that we just can't obey, which one? Name one. Just name one. This is the command. It's impossible to obey. I cannot do that. Which one is it? What would it be? It might be the one you're struggling with. It might be the one I'm struggling with. What command would that be? And the answer is, there is none. And thus our conclusion is that we can obey God. There's no additional empowering aid that is needed from God. When God tells me, here's what you need to do, I can do that. Now, that doesn't mean I've earned anything. I'm still being saved and being blessed by the grace of God, as we noted in our last study. So what have we seen in our study tonight? On sin and grace, we talked about man's ability to obey. 
this is an essential part of this neo-Calvinistic concept that we're shooting at and dealing with throughout this series of the problem with man's sin and grace. It's whether or not man has the ability to obey. We saw the erroneous concept that man is unable to obey. The abuse text, where some say, these say, we, don't, we can't do it. And then finally, the assurance from God, that man has the ability to obey. In our next study, we'll talk about are we under law? We're being told today that we're not under law. We don't live under law. We live under grace. We're not under a system of law. And then when pressured a little bit, some will back off and say, well, I'm not saying we're not under any law, but that's what you said, though. We'll talk about that next time. Are we under law? Next Lord's Day evening, Lord willing. There may be one or more present who's not a Christian, not a child of God, Despite what the Calvinist may tell you, you have the ability to be obedient to God. When God said hear, you can hear. When God said believe, you have the choice of believing. When God said repent, you can do that. And when God said confess your faith, you can do that. And when God said be baptized, you can do that. Or if you're an erring child of God to repent or confess and pray to God, you can do that too. You have the ability to be obedient to God. If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?